Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to DNews Plus today. I am Trace, and this is episode one of three in our new series about leaving Earth. Leaving Earth. We're leaving. It's gonna happen. It's inevitable. Make sure you subscribe so you get all the episodes of this series. You can find us on iTunes. You can also find us on SoundCloud now. Thank you to the people who tweeted at us and said, hey, get on SoundCloud because, hey, it's great. Thanks a lot for that. You can also find us, of course, right here on YouTube. And if this is your first time tuning into DNews Plus, welcome. Hi. This is a show where we take a big topic and we break it down so everyone can understand. And today, we're talking about leaving our planet. We're gonna talk about how we find habitable planets because we look for them all the time. We're gonna talk about terraforming other planets. Some of them are nearby. We're gonna talk about the plans that we have for leaving our planet because we do have those too. We're even gonna talk about a society on another planet and what that might look like. It's gonna be a really cool episode, so let's kick into it. There are a lot of factors that would come into play about us leaving our home planet. I mean, there's declining natural resources, there's overpopulation, there are asteroids that could hit us. On top of that, we might just want to, right? There might be people out there that want that sense of exploration and to spread humanity to other parts of this galaxy. I mean, that would be amazing, boldly going where, you know, no humans have gone before. Life exists, though, nowhere else in the universe that we know of but there will come a day, a deadline, that we have to leave this planet. It is inevitable. It will happen. I mean, planet-killing asteroids cross our path, our orbit, about once every 300,000 years, and they've caused mass extinction events in the past a few times. The sun only has a couple billion years before it will get too hot to boil our oceans away, and even if we could survive that, another 7.6 billion years, it's gonna start to expand and might envelop our whole planet, so we won't have a planet anymore. Global warming is causing all sorts of havoc with our food supply, our water supplies. Eventually, harvests are gonna be altered, and there are even places on Earth where we can grow food now that we won't be able to, so we don't know how much food we're gonna have in the future, which goes back to overpopulation. The Earth, according to scientists, can only house about 9 to 10 billion people. That's the theoretical peak. Now, in 1970, we were at 3.7 billion. By 1980, we had 4.5. By 2000, we had 6.1 billion. By 2012, we had 7 billion. That means in a very short period of time, we doubled in population, and we're looking at a population of 9 billion people by 2050. That's only a billion less than the theoretical peak population of our planet, and this will happen in our lifetimes. That's scary. Because then we come back to food and water supplies, too many people, not enough land area to grow resources for those people. Maybe we should just do a series on overpopulation of the planet. I mean, that would be really cool. Could talk about all these issues. Let us know if you think we should do that. You can also find us on Twitter, at DNews. Just use the hashtag DNews Plus. Either way, I'm just gonna wrap up this why we would leave Earth with a quote from one of my bays, Stephen Hawking. Quote, I believe that the long-term future of the human race must be in space. It will be difficult enough to avoid disaster on planet Earth in the next hundred years, let alone the next thousand or million. The human race shouldn't have all its eggs in one basket or on one planet. Let's hope we can avoid dropping the basket until we have spread the load. We're going to have to leave. It's inevitable. So people are already on it. Though to be honest, we actually don't know that much. For example, we have to figure out more about life before we can decide whether we can help life thrive in other places, right? But where did life even come from? So let's start there. Panspermia. Maybe life already came from space. So there are chemical compounds out there that we can exploit to help life thrive in places where it just hasn't started yet. One of the theories is that life began on another planet and was brought to ours via an asteroid or some other space body. So maybe began on Mars, for example, and traveled to Earth. There's actual science to this. The theory was by a highly regarded origins of life chemist with the Westheimer Institute of Science and Technology from Florida. His name was Stephen Benner. And he claimed that two elements are basically the precursor for life to form, and they didn't exist on our planet early on. But they were likely present on our neighboring planet, Mars. They found that out by studying meteorites of Mars that have found their way here to our planet, because it's not actually as uncommon as you might think. And it's crazy sounding, right? That Mars could have had these compounds, something hit Mars and an asteroid flew and hit us, and then they got to Earth. That does sound kind of crazy, but it's actually not all that crazy. So let me break it down a little bit. There are a few ideas at work here. Firstly is RNA. 
Secondly is the phosphate problem. So let's tackle each of these. Most scientists agree that life originated in water. Water is a lubrication for all chemical processes that life requires. No one really argues against that, but RNA, or ribonucleic acid, it's like DNA's buddy, it doesn't actually do very well in water. It just kind of falls apart. It's not great. And RNA is widely considered the earliest expression of genetic replication. It was actually here before DNA. Before DNA, there was RNA. It's a precursor to all life on Earth. There weren't even modern cells yet, but we had little RNA molecules. But there's a catch. When boron is present, RNA does fine. The thing is, according to geologists, the early Earth didn't have that much boron. But Mars had a good amount of it. So what happened is somehow that boron may have gotten from Mars to Earth, perhaps via the panspermia theory on some kind of asteroid. Then there's the phosphate problem that we mentioned earlier, also related to RNA. Phosphorus compounds are needed to form RNA, but also DNA and other proteins. But Earth phosphates, they're not that awesome. Researchers from the University of Nevada found phosphates in Martian meteorites were more water soluble than the early Earth phosphates. Mars, you're killing it. Or I guess you're more living it because it's better for Earth is killing it. Never mind, I'm, this is a confusing epithet. Obviously, we cannot prove anything conclusively in this, but the research is essentially saying that meteorites thrown from Mars could have landed here, bringing building blocks to Earth that worked inside of our own systems to have the right chemistry to create life. Now we have Facebook and Frank Ocean's new tracks and delivery pizza, it's the best. So knowing this, Mars might be a lifeboat for Earth if we needed to go the other way, right? Maybe, maybe it's the best suitor for supporting human life after Earth. But if we're looking at one, like just little Mars over there, why not look at more? Because we're still gonna have problems with asteroids and the sun is eventually gonna die. So it might be best to go find a couple other solar systems and spread out a little more. Scientists have all sorts of criteria for habitable planets and they are looking for them a lot. The Kepler mission has found tons of exoplanets. And there are some announcements coming down the pike pretty soon that they may have found some pretty close to us. So Keep an eye on the science and news wires for that. Side note, by the way, they sometimes call these planets Goldilocks planets because the conditions, you know, they have to be just right. Not too hot, not too cold, not too hard, not too soft, not too lumpy. You get it. Anyway, criteria. Around Earth size is a nice criteria point to start with because you have a mass around, you know, 5.9736 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. No big deal. Volume around 1.083 times 10 to the 12th kilometers cubed. You know, simple stuff. Can't be too picky. The reason you would want to have that, of course, is probably size is important for a level of gravity that we have evolved to live in because low gravity is bad. High gravity is also not great because our hearts are designed to only pump in a gravity similar to us and our bones and muscles start to degrade when we live in low gravity for long periods of time. All of that is dangerous and tough. So if we're going to pick the perfect planet, we may as well get close to our own, right? There's also the orbit. That's important. The planet would need to orbit its star about the same distance as Earth. Well, relative to the temperature of the star and how big it is and whatnot. You know, you want to orbit in what's called a habitable zone or a Goldilocks zone or a green zone where temperatures can sustain liquid water on the planet's surface. That's the important bit because we have a lot of water in us. We like it. It's great. Too close, the water's going to evaporate. It's going to be too hot. Too far, the water's going to freeze. It's going to be too cold. And that's a very specific zone because water freezes and boils in a very small temperature range. But we also have to take into account the size of all of that, right? The habitable zone is going to change depending on the size of the planet's star. So it's not always the same place. We also have to study the star's chemistry. We need to know how much energy the star is going to be throwing out and how much of those molecules or that energy is going to be absorbed into the planet's atmosphere and how much will get radiated back out into space. Then we have to take into account solar flares because if it's a super high solar activity area, that might not be great for human life. Basically, it's not easy to determine a planet's habitable zone as a whole. You have to look at every planet case by case. According to astrobiologist at NASA Ames Research Center, Chris McKay, there are four categories of the requirements for life on Earth that we should look for when we're looking at other planets. Energy, carbon, liquid water, and miscellaneous factors. Miscellaneous. 
So, energy. You remember in grade school biology class, animals are consumers, plants are producers, right? We don't make energy. We suck in energy made by other life forms. On Earth, we have producers. They create energy when they absorb light through photosynthesis. Chemical reactions transfer that energy from molecule to molecule. We eat that and then we take in that energy. Yum, it's great. So we need to do that on other planets too. You know, we can't make energy. We are consumers. Pretty important. Another one, carbon. Kind of a big deal. Basically the backbone of all life as we know it on Earth. It can support crazy variations of molecules in biology. It's, you know, kind of a big chemical. There's a reason that people who take organic chemistry in college cry because most of it is carbon. It's a lot of carbon. We are carbon-based and so all the life we have on Earth is also carbon-based. We should have carbon on whatever new planet we go to. There's also liquid water. We just talked a little bit about that. It's the universal solvent. All chemical reactions for life on Earth take place in it. And of course, you know, a nice tall glass of lemonade is nice. Can't have that without water. Also, life cells are full of it, uh, water. So we need that. It's pretty important. McKay also noted that while light is important for life, there is life on Earth that doesn't get much light at all and still survives. Think algae and things very deep in the ocean. Um, algae is actually pretty amazing. Maybe we should do a series on algae too. Uh, when you're looking for a new place to live, you have to break down needs and wants, right? So far we've talked mostly about needs. We need liquid water. We need some kind of producer for our energy source. We need carbon so that we can consume food and whatnot. Some of the wants though, there are wants, you know, you can have like the perfect apartment and then have some that are like, this is perfect, but it also has a dishwasher. Yeah. So atmosphere, that's important. Mars, it's not big enough to hold on to an atmosphere. That's another reason we need a massive or larger planet. It doesn't have enough of an electromagnetic field either to block the sun's solar wind from stealing whatever atmosphere we would be able to impart to it, which we'll come back to during the terraforming section. So Mars has almost no air and we like air, so air is kind of important, something to keep in mind. Of course, we could live inside, you know, in domes and things. There's also temperature, you know, good air often means good temperature, but not always. It keeps the planet warm enough for life and survival so we don't have to live inside forever. Nitrogen is important, it helps form proteins and DNA. There's the nitrogen cycle that helps plants grow and die and grow again. Maybe you saw the Martian, that's why he needed all that poop to get some of that nitrogen into his uh, Martian soil. There's a lot of stuff to think about when we think about looking for a new Earth home. We did not evolve to live independent of Earth. This is a completely, I think to use just the right word, alien idea. So can we live on any other planet? Are we destined to expire when our sun goes out? Well, a study at the University of Puerto Rico at Arecibo was done on just this. The producer of the study, Professor Abel Mendez, developed a quantitative habitability theory. The study evaluated the current state of habitability on Earth and compared it to other planets, including extrasolar planets or exoplanets. The theory takes into account two main parameters, habitat quality and habitation. Essentially, life's potential to grow in an environment and also a measure of biodensity or occupancy. They used all sorts of planetary models to calculate and compare how Mars, Venus, Europa, Titan, and Enceladus are closest neighbors that may support life, how they would all do. And without getting into the specifics, because as you can probably tell, this gets pretty technical pretty fast. Enceladus has the highest subsurface habitability in the solar system, but it's too deep for direct exploration. So it may be habitable, but we can't easily go there and check. Mars and Europa had the best compromise between habitability and accessibility, but we need a lot more study to figure out whether this theory can form the basis of a new way to look for habitable planets, because we got to look for light and carbon dioxide and oxygen and nutrient concentrations. Guys, there's so much here. We've got a long way to go, but we're getting there. People like the 100-year Starship Project want to put humans in another solar system within a century. So they're looking at problems like this all the time, how to get people to live in space for long periods off of a planet. Getting onto a planet then might make things easier, but it could make things harder too. In the end, we're always going to have to leave Earth. We have to go. Earth is our mother, and you can't live at your mom's house forever. I mean, some people can, but 
Most people can't. At some point, you have to leave and you have to go find out the world for yourself. In our case, humanity's gonna need to learn to adult too. That means getting out of mom's house. What if we travel to another planet that's less hospitable for humans? Can we change the environment there to fit our needs? Terraform, you know, big bubble domes and stuff. If you wanna learn about how that stuff works, come back tomorrow, because that's what we're gonna talk about. And if you wanna learn how things are made, you should go to the App Store and download the free Science Go app. Watch all the seasons of How It's Made because it's amazing. It's the best show around. And check out your other favorite Science Channel shows like Alien Encounters. My friend worked on that show. Check it out. Link's in the description. It's pretty cool. Thanks a lot for tuning in to DNews Plus today. Let us know down in the comments. Would you be one of those first people to leave Earth? Like, let's say we found a planet. Close enough that you could go. Would you go? Let us know in the comments. I don't know if I would go, guys. I don't know. Thanks for watching D News Plus. We'll see you tomorrow for terraforming. It's going to be super cool or warm, depending on the planet.